So can you tell me what your name is and what your title is? My name is Audrey Tang, and I'm Digital Minister of Taiwan in charge of open government, youth engagement, and social innovation. Can you tell me what a minister without a portfolio is? A horizontal minister is someone in the cabinet. There's nine of us. We're above the 32 ministries, which all have a vertical minister, and the nine horizontal ministers are in charge of working with those ministries to ensure that people have common values despite their different takes and positions and aspects on the society. And what falls within your portfolio? I answer that. Um, can, you, <laughs> can you speak a little bit more in depth of what some of those principles involve and kind of your day to day? So my work on open government rests on the idea of us bringing technology to where people are instead of asking people to come to technology. So I can work anywhere, I tour around Taiwan, indeed around the world, but mostly to listen at scale at what the local people feel that needs the various different ministries to solve. It could be, for example, about biodiversity, it could be about the local people um, suffering a systemic injustice, it could be the local people doesn't have uh, access to broadband, uh, which is a human right in Taiwan, and so anywhere in Taiwan, if you don't have 10 megabits per second, that's my fault. So a digital minister and um, digital democracy are pretty innovative approaches for government. Um, how did Taiwan evolve to have these purposes, in your opinion? Back in 1989, Taiwan was, uh, for the first time, experiencing personal computers as the rest of the world. Uh, however, that's the first time that we have the freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, and also the freedom to form political parties. Before that, it was uh, decades of martial law. So in Taiwan, personal computer and personal freedom of expression occurred literally in the same year. And then later in 1996, that's the first year of presidential election, our first election for president, but also the first year that the wild web got really popular. So in Taiwan, internet and democracy, instead of two different branches, are interwoven together, and we participated in the creation of democracy as any social technology that's part of the internet community. Can you tell me about what the Sunflower Movement was and what its influence is today? The Sunflower Movement, which occurred in 2014, was 22 days of occupying the parliament as a demonstration to deliberate the cross-strait service and trade agreement, which at the time the MPs were refusing to deliberate, citing that this is purely an administrative um, matter, uh, and the students occupied not to protest, but rather to demonstrate how half a million people in the street and many more online can come to the set of demands, not one less, uh, for the parliament. And the head of parliament did take those consensus and said Occupy was a success. How has, how has government changed since the Sunflower Movement? At the end of 2014, in a mayoral election, everybody who supported the Sunflower Movement got elected mayors, sometimes to their surprise and people who did not support open government lose their mayor elections. So right afterwards, there was a cabinet reshuffle, and the occupiers and their facilitators and mentors uh, were then hired as reverse mentors to the cabinet, and the cabinet engaged on the civic technology community to collaboratively build projects such as V Taiwan and JOIN, uh, those new projects that can listen at scale much as the occupiers did during the Occupy, but without having to occupy the parliament for each and every uh, subject matter. Can you define civic tech? Civic tech is technology that facilitates civic participation, and the technology itself is co-created by everybody in the social sector. Can you describe your relationship with being part of government and part of the civic tech community? I'm working with the government. I don't consider myself working for the government as a part of it. 
as a kind of someone at a Lagrange point, uh, a midpoint uh, between the movement on one side and the government on the other. My role is to facilitate uh, channels of communication to make sure that people can focus their energy on the common values instead of on the different uh, showdown of opposing positions. While we understand, of course, people have different positions, there are certain values such as sustainable development that captures everybody's common understanding and we focus on those common understanding and develop co-create solutions based on these. And what is the relationship of civic tech, government, and journalism in Taiwan? Mm, sorry, civic tech, government, and journalism? Yes. Uh, okay. Well, a different order uh, in your outline, so... Okay, go ahead. It's okay. The relationship of civic tech and journalism in Taiwan goes way back. As I said, the journalists first got their freedom of the press around the same time that personal computer uh, entered into the world. And so because of that, there's a lot of traditions of technologists working, for example, uh, blogging um, and now microblogging and so on, has a very deep root in the civic technology. Indeed, the largest forum, PTT here, which is similar to Reddit, is open source operated by civic technologists without any commercial uh, endeavor behind it. And we see them out. Sorry, wrong role. So, okay, uh, let's, let's do this again. The civic tech movement in Taiwan started around the time that personal computers become available, but that's again the same time that freedom of the press uh, starts becoming available in the Taiwan society. So there's a lot of emphasis on the internet as a public space for discussion uh, in Taiwan. For example, the largest bulletin board for a public forum like Reddit uh, in Taiwan is called the PTT, but it stays open source, open governance without any proprietary or commercial interest uh, behind it. It. and a lot of journalists uh, worked with the civic tech community to deepen their uh, investigative journalism, their fact-checking, as well as data reporting uh, capabilities. And in Taiwan, because we consider the journalists' words always worth equal or more than the minister's words, so we always make sure that we introduce our government technology based on civic technology without decimating uh, the journalists' um, understanding or legitimacy. Would you say it is a value and important um, in Taiwan for government to maintain an equal power dynamic with civil society and, and journalists? Definitely. Um, the decades before the lifting of the martial law already saw a lot of social sector organizations gaining a lot of legitimacy on the community building front. Uh, and there's a decade between the Freedom of Assembly and the presidential election. So <clears throat> the large civil society organizations have a head start of at least 10 years before the president. Uh, and so they still now have more legitimacy than the administration. And because of that, the government here always is very careful uh, about not to encroach uh, on the rise and the legitimacy of the social sector leadership. And the social sector leadership still uh, assembles and organizes interested people to solve social problems without waiting for the government to come up with a plan or a policy. So for the administration, it's always a out. We cannot beat them, so we must join them, them being the activists. Would you say that democracy is being threatened in Taiwan? I would say that uh, across the globe, people are seeing that the newest wave of social technologies, namely social media, uh, it is making the amplification of anger into outrage much easier than before. And because of that, democracy, which rests on the public discussion and public opinions based on the shared access to facts, is being threatened everywhere in the world. Taiwan, of course, is no exception. <coughs> So to your point, disinformation or fake news or misinformation is a global issue. Um, can you define that for us? In Taiwan, we don't use the term quote, fake news, unquote, uh, because news and journalism translates to the same Mandarin word, Xinwen. So there is no way to say, quote, fake news, unquote, without affronting journalists. And because both my parents are journalists, I, out of filial piety, I cannot use the F word. This next second. So um, in this information in Taiwan has a legal definition. It means intentional untruth that causes harm to the public. The emphasis is harming the public, 
such as the democratic process, such as around public health and so on, and not harming the image uh, of a minister, which may be just good journalism. And so, because all three criteria need to be satisfied uh, concurrently for it to be qualified as disinformation, we make sure that our counter disinformation uh, efforts do not infringe on the rights of making a parody, making satire, and things like that. So you mentioned that the harm of, of disinformation. Yeah. Can you um, say what some of the consequences of disinformation are, what that harm actually looks like? The main harm of disinformation is to discourage people from participating in democratic discourse. Uh, it is to make sure uh, that people who uh, believe different things keep believing those different things and uh, lack the agency to talk to one another. And so in very concrete terms, for example, uh, currently, like right now, there is a disinformation circulating around that says uh, the uh, Central Election Committee choose to use an ink uh, for the ballot process and if you uh, use uh, that ink uh, to cast your vote, uh, that vote will not be counted. And that is to discourage people from going to the voting booth. How, in, in, your, in your position, in your role, how is it that you um, address disinformation? Sorry, could you just wait until that? Sure. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Ambulances. Always get in the way of enemies. I know. Those airplanes. I know. Screaming people. I know. Saints. It's like they're in an emergency. Oh, wait, they are. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're just coming for lunch and they always want to get the traffic out of the way. I see, I see, I see. They'll probably call, um, you know, Deliveroo or something like that. <laughs> okay, okay, we're okay. Okay. So say the question again. So, um, can you explain um, some of the specific ways that you and in your capacity, how you address the disinformation? As I said, uh, my work is on open government and social innovation. The open government idea hinges on us making a clear and timely response whenever there is a misunderstanding or misinformation. Because people, it's okay to suspect uh, things about public policy, but if we don't come around and say something clarifying within an hour or two, then this information can still discord by uh, looking at the divisions uh, in the misinformation and then uh, further segment the people. And so we always make sure whenever there is a trending piece of misinformation, we roll out funny, mimetic, engineered uh, pieces of clarification that are organically funny, meaning that when people look at it, uh, they don't reinforce their stereotypes, they rather find it fun, so they're willing to share. Um, are there policy changes that you think um, either that the tech industry should consider whenever it comes to um, combating disinformation on the platforms? I think honest advertisement is very important. In Taiwan, we have a separate branch of the government called the control branch. Uh, in charge of publishing all the campaign donation and expense. And so for the previous election and this upcoming uh, one, they publish uh, the raw data, the individual record of donation and expense. And that is controlled by a separate branch to ensure that their um, legitimacy. And because of that, we have a very firm norm that we communicated to all the social media companies saying that in our jurisdiction, you are required, if people place political advertisement, to disclose it at least to the same standard as our control branch and they largely complied and whoever did not comply for the, this upcoming election did not run political advertisements. Can you speak to um, what <coughs> um, some of the tech platforms are doing around this um, election? You mentioned a war room, for example. Can you speak a little bit more to that? In, um, in the coordination uh, with the general public as well as with uh, stakeholders, a very important part is for the large social media platforms to sign on their own, uh, what we call a norm package, or in their words, is a counter disinformation self-regulatory policy. 
And part of that policy is to communicate with all the interested stakeholders in a timely fashion whenever there is a large scale social event. And election, of course, is a large scale social event. So uh, as we understand, uh, for example, FB have set up uh, people in Taiwan uh, as a war room uh, to provide fast, rapid response and communication with all stakeholders, like all political parties and so on, when, if there is anything unexpected happening the day before election, for example. Would you <coughs> also say that proactive approaches like open government, mm -hmm. transparency, um, good government communications mm -hmm. are good defenses that, govern that other governments can use against mm -hmm. disinformation? Yes. Um, in the open government work, as I mentioned, the clarification, the real-time context, the day-to-day -day participation, including participatory budget and petition, all makes sure that there is sufficient communication and diversity in the civil society so that whenever this information or propaganda came, it cannot capture the imagination of a lot of people because most people understand the whole context. On the social innovation side, we're also seeing a boom of fact-checking networks and a lot of institutional media they are now working with the civic tech community to provide, for example, real-time fact-checking during the presidential policy forum and the policy debate. What can citizens and civil society do in other countries to encourage these principles um, in their government, these differences in their government? I think uh, there's two lessons that we learned. The first is that institutional journalism is our best friend. Try to make sure that institutional journalists who are able to establish their own fact-checking mechanisms and so on, share broadly how they are going about doing the fact-checking to the entire society. Because with broadband as a human right in Taiwan, everybody is a media. Everybody can start a live stream with no additional cost. In that, people's media literacy is not as important as people's media competency because everybody is a journalist, potentially. And so just to democratize journalism and making sure that people can participate in institutional journalism's fact-checking process is the first lesson. And the second one is to make sure that whenever there is a grassroots, uh, large-scale like fact-checking uh, platform going on, we make sure that we communicate with all the stakeholders about what this actually does. And the government must support, but does not control all these grassroots efforts. This question is not included in the list, but mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that you spend time observing um, other governments and with other governments um, globally. Um, have you noticed a, a difference in foreign influence in, in disinformation elections in other country contexts? So I wouldn't name names, but okay. <coughs> um, right. Uh, according to the Human Rights Association uh, Civicus Monitor, Taiwan is the only jurisdiction in Asia now that uh, remains fully open when it comes to the rights to assemble and the freedom of the press. Uh, I think one of the reasons is that the disinformation crisis uh, actually made it kind of attractive for nearby jurisdictions to go the path of a minister can, for example, take down a journalist's word. That seems like a shortcut, but on the long term, it decimates people's capability to do critical thinking and creative thinking together. And so I think Taiwan provides a viable role model to make sure that people have in their own capabilities a fact-checking network without relying on certain administrative branch agencies or units or ministers to perform that role. Other countries are um, are kind of being affected by disinformation in the same way as Taiwan. The the effect of it is similar. I think uh, across all jurisdictions, as long as people have free access to the internet and the freedom to post things on the internet and share things on the internet without even reading through what they're sharing. Uh, of course, there is a, a large effect of disinformation because the uh, mobile uh, form factor makes it easier for people to look just at one picture or one part of the data uh, before reading through it. They just instinctively think that this uh, makes me angry and angry is a negative emotion suppressing so share, turning that anger into our 
rage is a very easy psychological outlet. And so that uh, psychological response, I think it's just part of uh, Homo sapiens. <laughs> and so anywhere on the world, uh, we're looking at the same thing. Um, has trust in the democratic process and, and in government um, declined because of foreign influence in Taiwan? I think in Taiwan, the democratic process is generally seen as something that people can co-create. And so we have a lot of new forms of democracy, such as participatory budgets, such as sandboxes, petitions, the presidential hackathon referenda, uh, you name it. And because of that, there is still a lot of um, aspiration in the younger population, but also across all age groups, to co-create new forms of democracy. And that made us more resilient, I think, than the more uh, institutionalized or historical forms of democracy, because people still feel that they they can make something better if the old form of representative democracy is somehow threatened. You mentioned this, but I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more specifically about why why other countries are trying to influence Thailand's elections and the Taiwanese people. Mm -hmm. There are, um, of course, always commercial interests, uh, and this is as old as the email. Uh, there's a lot of uh, spam and scam in email um, back around the turn of the century, so much so that there are serious proposals saying that we need to start charging postal stamp for each email, otherwise our inbox is flooded with spam and scam. Uh, however, the solution in Taiwan eventually is not passing any law against spam, but rather joining international networks such as Spawn House, making sure that everybody have the capability to flag something as fun, essentially donating a piece of information for people to analyze together. And if they match that pattern, then on the next email, they land into people's junk mail uh, box uh, without landing into people's inbox. And so changing the commercial incentives of the spam and scam uh, emails. So that's the commercial interest and it's always there. But part of the commercial interest uh, overlap with the political interest. For example, uh, based on the scams and spams, we see that the pop approach uh, that uh, people look at this information is to see whether they concern their family's health. If they don't concern their family's health, people don't tend to share it. But if it's about food safety, for example, in Taiwan, people will share it uh, very vigorously. And so then there came the political campaigns to sow this court specifically about agricultural products, about um, the trade relationships with certain uh, other jurisdictions, about food and things like that. And those become politicized, and that is one of the key uh, venues that uh, overseas actors are trying to capitalize on the uh, common cause about the food safety issue, which seems uh, very uh, benign, but it, you can actually see a lot of disinformation operations just based on food safety and agricultural products. Um, do you see parallels between what is happening in Hong Kong and what happen in Taiwan? So um, as part of our uh, sunflower movement, a lot of our work is centered around the idea of a so-called leaderless movement, making sure that everybody in a large-scale movement doesn't wait for somebody's order, but rather can just improvise uh, based on the situation and share it with everybody else on the same street so that they can learn from each other's best practices. Uh, back in 2014, it's not really leaderless, it's like 20 different NGOs as leaders, so polycentric but not decentralized. But in Hong Kong, we're seeing easily more than 2,000 different leaders on LIHKG and on Telegram and so on. And so they're, I think, uh, further than we, what we did in 2014 when it comes to true leaderless movements. Um. Would you say that city tech could be a remedy for foreign influence? I would say that civic tech is a great way to ensure that people understand the context, the why of policy making, not just the what of the laws and regulation that gets passed. And with the understanding of the common context, 
people become much more resilient uh, for uh, like one-sided, lopsided conversations or propaganda or uh, these kind of accusation and things like that. Because once you understand the whole context, the various different stakes of the multi-stakeholder approach, then people become inoculated against oversimplification. And oversimplification is indeed what this information is relying on. Um, regardless of the election outcome, what would you say is most important for the Taiwanese people mm -hmm. to remember during the day after the election and to um, value during this election process? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, that democracy is a social technology that is still evolving. So if people find any part of the democratic process amenable to change, uh, there's plenty of ways for people to effect that change, especially now that we've moved the referenda to alternating years as election would have a representative year and a participatory year and a representative year and a participatory year in that temple. So anything that people feel that need to be changed as part of the election process, they can actually initiate and e-collecting actually is going to be uh, possible for the next referenda as well. So feel free to start a e-collecting to change any part of the democratic process that you think need changing. So this video will be viewed by, by Democrats and, um, and um, so activists everywhere. Um, what would be your advice to them as they are combating disinformation in their country? I think uh, humor is the most potent uh, antidote. If people can turn their anger into fun and joy and humor, uh, it's a mutually exclusive pathway to outrage. So if you have laughed about something, it's very hard to feel outrage about that, and vice versa. And so a key learning in our work is to work with mimetic engineers, also known as professional comedians, uh, to make sure that the information uh, that we roll out is funny, but without making fun of others, but rather making fun of ourselves in its own uh, delivery. And in that sense, it will not enforce the uh, stereotypes that people have in their mind, but rather um, make sure that they can also listen at scale to the people who feel differently from them, and that is the power of humor. She asked, um, could Taiwan be the next Hong Kong? Not about the movement so much, but like, is what you're seeing happening in Hong Kong with them protesting because they want democracy, could that happen in Taiwan one day? Could, could Taiwan be the next Hong Kong where China is going, you know what? We're taking over and you're gonna have to fight for democracy. So, um, so I'll incorporate part of the question. Okay. Okay. So just like uh, in sunflower movement, uh, after the anti elab protests, the Hong Kong people uh, who participate uh, on the street eventually won the uh, district level elections. But unlike in Taiwan, of course, there is a ceiling of what they can do uh, based on their quote, one country, two system, unquote, arrangement uh, with Beijing. And so it is very rare, actually, the first time in Taiwan's presidential election history that all the candidates are against quote, one country, two systems, unquote. Hong Kong's uh, story told us that we must not let something like that happen to Taiwan, but rather we would like today's Taiwan be tomorrow's Hong Kong. Indeed, the, the freshly elected district councillors in Hong Kong uh, often visited Taiwan. I've talked with a few uh, to learn about our community building and grassroots democracy efforts because they understand in Taiwan we also took a few decades to get to where we are and they have to start building their legitimacy, much as how Taiwan's uh, social sector built their legitimacy even before the lifting of the martial law. Is there anything else that you think would be important to right, say? It's good. It's good. It's good. What about, um, just because we talked about this, obviously someone's going to win the election, but like it's going to be one or the other. But at the end of the day, does it really matter? The fact that everyone has a voice, is that what's more important? A lot of people is going to win. We're a... <laughs> Uh, we're electing members of parliament too, <laughs> so lots of winners. Um, okay. 
So I think people participating in the democratic process understand that even if their elected um, MP isn't quite the person they put on their ballot, or if uh, the presidential candidate that they like did not eventually become the president, there is always two years later uh, a mayoral election and in between those two elections a referenda uh, year where they can change the rules also by e-collecting. And so this co-creative process ensure that people can always participate in a constructive manner into the democracy as a social technology instead of just relying on existing institutions, we can build ones that are better. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.